Today we'll be discussing the new hit Netflix show, Squid Game, and we'll be debating the question, should doctors cry? This is Doctor vs. Comedian. I'm Dr. Asif Doja, and this is the Doctor of Laughs. Not a real doctor. Ali Hassan. Every episode, I pick a topic for Ali from comedy and entertainment, and I question him about it. Then Ali picks a topic from medicine and health and grills me on that topic. Today, we'll be talking about the number one Netflix show in the world, Squid Game. And we'll be debating the question, should doctors cry? I'm sure some doctors cry in their, in their private lives. I mm. meant in their public lives. Yeah, yes. Many cry themselves to sleep. Probably, right? For a variety of reasons. Sometimes unrelated to medicine, probably. But yes, you are talking about professionally speaking. And it's interesting. Anyway, we'll get to it. We have other stuff to talk about before we get yeah, to it. Yeah, we got so. uh, Squid Game. And well, let's get into it. Don't got a lot of money. Drive a rusted out Chevy. I just got laid off, Lord tab ain't paid off. My ex-wife hates me, even had to sell my puppy. Yes, I'm broken, it's a damn shame. Yes, I gotta play the squid game. Yes, I gotta play the squid game. My only option is the squid game. I'll just divulge information about myself here. I have watched one full episode and almost finished a second episode and in the netflix world in the um you know pop culture world in the television world that is like if you compare that to the real estate market it's like i've had my house on the market for four months in a hot market it's like i got the wrong numbers in the wrong game i should absolutely 100 percent be finished squid game yeah, but i'm you're not stupid I know. Uh, but, well, why don't we just back up? Because I, I did want to talk to you about this show. Yeah, this, this wasn't the end of the conversation about Squid Game by any means. So back right up as far as you want, Asif. <laughs> this show is quite the global phenomenon. As I mentioned, it's the number one Netflix show in the world right now. It has 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's really amazing in terms of how well it's doing. And I think it speaks to this bigger... South Korean influence specifically on the world. One of the biggest bands in the world, some would say the biggest band in the world is BTS. And, and last year at the Oscars, uh, Bong uh, Jun hos Parasite did extremely well. Did you see Parasite? Yeah, yeah, I love Parasite. Parasite's an amazing movie. I love his other movies as well. And so this show kind of comes out and I call it The Prisoner. Do you remember The Prisoner from the 1960s? Sure, 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 sure. I say it's The Prisoner meets Hunger Games. That's what it kind of reminds me of. Sure. When I looked at the name, I'm like, why is this trending number one? What is this? You know, that's mm. where I first saw it. I'm like, what is this? And you read a synopsis, you know, people who are in debt are forced to compete in a game show type environment playing children's games. And then my wife turns to me and she's like, is this like a real show or is this, you know, cause that's the only thing you get like, and it could yeah. very well be like a documentary. Yeah. About some crazy game show coming from Asia. I did want to talk about it because it's kind of what everybody's talking about these days and we don't have water cooler conversations anymore. That's right. By the way, you're giving a ton of credit to Korea and to Korean filmmaking and television making. And I think that's, Definitely well-deserved, and I, I'm a huge fan as well. But also some credit goes to Ted Sarandos, CEO of Netflix, because this mm -hmm. is part of a vision of his. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. worth mentioning that the director of Squid Game, Huang Dong-hyuk, he wrote this movie in 2008. I mean, wrote, wrote this uh, series. I keep saying movie because it plays like a it movie. It does play like a movie, doesn't it? And, yeah, it really and, and does. I was, yeah. and I'm just going to interrupt you for a sec. It makes me think if they ever made an American version, which I have not seen so far, and I don't really know if it's necessary. I hope they not would probably to. just turn it into a movie. They'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just cut out all this extra stuff. Just make it into a movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they would call it like killer squid game or something to make it more sexy or whatever I, you know how we always have to change names here mm. no it's phenomenal in its present form just like parasite doesn't need to be redone some movies just don't need to be redone 
people can watch subtitles and enjoy them. And I think the success of this shows that. Like, you can just enjoy something. You know, hundreds of millions of people are watching this with subtitles on. It's fine. But Ted Sarandos, who is the uh, CEO, I think co-CEO of Netflix, in 2018, he said, like, look, we're looking for successful overseas productions. An ideal thing for him would be to get a Stranger Things type of show from outside America. He says, right now, that's we only find those things on those scales in Hollywood. And he was looking out. And so, yeah, I mean, a little bit of credit to him for his vision, for what he was searching for. And then, of course, Huang Dong-hyuk having had this product for so long in his hands. Right. Yeah, you were saying that it was it was he initially thought about it in 2008, but he couldn't get it produced. And then Netflix, I don't know if they kind of heard about it or however they got in touch with him. Yeah. Or it was submitted to Netflix and they were like, yeah, this is it. We're doing it. Here's the money. Let's let's go forward with it. Phenomenal. I always like those backstories about that. Yeah, of course. And uh, he said he based it on a lot of Japanese mangas. Battle Royale is probably the one that people are most familiar with. That was like from like 20 years ago or so. And it's children kind of competing in violent games. So not children Mm. competing in children's games, violent games. And it's a precursor to the Hunger Games for sure. I mean, you can't deny the influence of Battle Royale on the Hunger Games. Mm -hmm. Not just that manga, but different ones. And basically, you know, the concept for people, and we won't do any spoilers, at least right now in the show, but there's 456 players who all are in a certain amount of debt, whether it's to banks, creditors, loan sharks, the main character, it's clearly loan sharks who are looking for money because he has some gambling debts and from different walks of life. And then they're approached to basically pay off their debt and they can win this huge prize. It's 45.6 billion won, South Korean won, which I think is like in the millions of dollars in terms right. of. Right. It was interesting because in the first episode, they spell it W O N. Mm-hmm. And because there's all this gambling going on, I kept thinking it's like, it's this much money won. It's this much money won. Yeah. And then I re- realized, oh, that is W-A-N, which I, I've clear, you know, historically seen it W-A-N in the spelling. Mm-hmm. But yeah, anyway, I just give that out in the case anybody else has not watched it. If there's any of you out there who haven't, you might face that same confusion. There's two main characters in it, uh, Ji-hun and Sang-woo. It's interesting. They're based on Huang's own experiences, and he says they're kind of two double sides identity of himself. Almost. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah. like Ji Hun is like him in that he was raised by a single mother. They didn't have a lot of money growing up, and Sang Wu is the, the kind of the more successful person who also gets into debt trouble. Who's a friend of of Ji Hun, and Huang also attended Seoul National University, a very famous university in Korea, and had very high expectations. And, you know, do you live up to those expectations or not? Which is what yeah. Sangu does. And these are the two central characters in the show. That's right. Ji Hun keeps telling Sangu, you're the pride of this neighborhood. You're the pride of this area mm-hmm. because of the fact that he went to this university and he was, you know, in, you know I don't know what he is in, some kind of financial, a banker of some kind. Corrupt banker, spoiler alert. I mean, it's just really surpassing all expectations. Within its first 28 days of availability on Netflix, it drew more than 111 million viewers. And it's surpassed Bridgerton, Thirst Trap Bridgerton, as the Mm -hmm. network's most watched show ever. I mean, it's just amazing when you think about how much other shows, as you mentioned Stranger Things, these other Netflix produced shows, get into the cultural consciousness to know that that many people have watched it. And I think it's sometimes these things are just, you know, it's that interesting name. Like, what are, what are they talking about? Squid Game? Like, mm. what is that? Is there a squid? What's going on? Then it intrigues you that it's from Korea. I went to ask you, do you, you watch it with subtitles? As you were saying, you don't listen to the dub version because there is a dub version. Oh, I would never do that. I would never do that. That would be distressing, I think. I thought you were asking me if do I watch it in Korean and then just hope that I understand something. Uh, I didn't even know there was a dub version. But hey, listen, speaking of languages, you saw that there's Anupam Tripathi. He plays Ali Abdul. So there's a a Muslim character from Pakistan who's on the show, and they had to find this foreign actor who lived in Korea, who's fluent in Korean, mm. but who can play someone who's from Pakistan and, and his kind of thing. So we yeah. happen to hear some Urdu in the... Uh... He's actually fantastic. And he's yeah. New Delhi born, went to Korea for university, and within a couple of years became absolutely fluent in Korean. 
he was just this godsend from casting. The casting in the show is incredible. Amazing. By the way, everyone is so perfect in their roles. But anyway, to find this particular Muslim character was odd. The only thing I thought, <laughs> the only thing I was like, mm, that felt forced, was when he said, Salaam Alaikum, into the phone. <laughs> Asalaam, the way he said it, it was like as if, if you were saying, Asalaam Alaikum, in the phone. People would be like, yeah, that's not authentic. But besides that, uh, uh, by the wonderful way, I, <laughs> people are not going to get that joke because it's because I don't speak Urdu very well at all yeah. and he not with a correct the accent. Word Urdu exactly. Very that's, well, what, that's, what, the, that's, yeah. that's what Ali's saying. Yeah, but listen, Ali, you lost out because you could have been the English dub voice for Ali Abdul. Like, what happened <laughs> yes. to that? Where is your agent? You could have been in the biggest show that. in the world right now. I will, I will have a word. I will have a very, word. Very, very embarrassing. Uncle I agree Ryan. with you, but. I agree with you about the casting. The casting is amazing. And you watch this and you're like, I must admit, when I watch foreign shows or foreign films, I do sometimes think, who could play this? Who could do this? And some characters, like I could imagine with Sang Woo, there could be some actors who could do it and things like that. But Ji Hoon, who's the main character, I can't imagine anyone being able to play that role mm. as well as he does, like an English speaking actor. I couldn't think of one. Further to that, having known some degenerate gamblers personally in my life, he really nails that role. Mm -hmm. He really mm -hmm. nails that role of like, you know, it's almost like a mania. It's up and down. The lows are super low. The highs are super high. And just waiting for that next hit, waiting for that adrenaline shot, the gambling or taking risks mm -hmm. at all costs on paper, just the stupidest ideas but it just makes sense to you when you're in that moment. And he really, really nails that. And his energy is so great. A shout out to Kim Ju Ryong. Yeah. Uh, whose name I'm, I'm for sure mispronouncing. Probably. She plays Han Min Niu. And you're like, well, which, who's that? It's player 212. Yeah. As a person who's only watched one and a half episodes or one and two thirds episodes, I don't actually understand that shout out just yet. Okay, you'll see what happens with her character later on. So she's one of the female players in this tournament. Yeah. She's kind of the grifter. She's the one in one of the first episodes who's talking about she has kids and you can't yeah, do this to I've me. I've seen her beg for forgiveness yes. and beg for her life and beg for her exit from the game. She constantly lies, constantly stretches the truth, constantly going back on what she said just in order to survive. But mm. that actress is so good. It's again, I cannot imagine anyone else playing that role. She is just amazing because she and she's hilarious. Such a well acted and well written role. A big shout out. But anyway, Ali, so I finished the whole thing. I guess I didn't tell everybody that at the beginning. You just had to brag about your big one and two thirds episodes. <laughs> that was the, that's the opposite of bragging. Brag, I feel that's right. ashamed, but yeah. So, what do you think so far? And I'll give you my thoughts after. I'm going to say two negative things about this because, you know, it can't be all a huge celebration for Squid Game. Number one thing is after the first episode, I was like, man, if I wasn't doing this for the podcast, I don't know if I'd watch the second episode. And I think the reason is because there's a lot of violence. It feels gratuitous. It feels unnecessary. Yeah. By definition, there's gratuitous violence. in it. Of course. Oh, of yeah. course. That one scene in the first episode is pretty violent. And I was like, ah, I don't know if I want to watch this. Within 10 minutes of being into the second episode, I was like, well, that was a stupid thought <laughs> because there's so much depth in these characters already. Even his mother, Ji Hoon's mother, is just so great, man. Mm -hmm, it's just so, mm -hmm. so great. Good. I don't know, man. You just fall in love with these characters and like you watch a scene, it's so good that it makes you forget about 20 minutes of gratuitous violence in the first episode. So anyway, I take back those words and I'm excited to finish this series. Number two negative thing, which is not negative for any of us, but it is a crazy, insane fact the director, Huang Da Kyuk, I don't know if you read this, lost six teeth because of the stress <laughs> of making this show. I, 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 I want to say that, A, because that is insane, but also to sort of like, you know, I'm working on a show right now, and the show I'm, I'm on is called Run the Burbs. They believe in some level of load management for directors. So in other words, directors will direct two episodes and then take a break, and right. then maybe come back, direct another two, maybe not. And I don't know if this is a Canadian thing. I don't know if this is happening everywhere. You see it with like the shows like Ozark. My wife and I were watching Ozark so intently that we we're like, oh, yes, this director. We like it when this oh, director wow, directs wow. it. Yeah. 
but you understand why when you're on these productions. And, you know, somebody had told me the other day, and I, I, this is just rumors, this is just hearsay, but somebody had told me that, you know, for a Canadian sitcom, you can make like 70,000 bucks directing an episode. Wouldn't that be amazing? And I was like, no, no, that would be the worst thing ever. I have no interest in that. The director is there way earlier than anybody else. They're constantly on the entire day. There's no asleep at the wheel. Then they're there after watching what we call the rushes, which are the scenes from the day piecing together. Then they still take it home mm -hmm. after all of that. And mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, I have no interest and I have no interest in being on that side of the camera. But I just wanted to, you know, as you have a drink tonight, pour a little bit of your booze out for the six missing teeth of this incredible director and the stress that they go through. It's something, I mean, you could offer me a million to direct an episode or something. I don't want it. Yeah, that is a good point. He wrote and directed every episode, which, as you said, is very uncommon. Even like when you look at Game of Thrones, because a show like that is such a huge budget, so many moving parts, you couldn't do that. Just not possible for one yeah. director to direct the whole show. And so, yeah, the amount of stress, again, he has this huge amount of money from Netflix that he has to, you know, complete his vision. A uh, lot of stress. You know, a, a couple other criticisms I've heard of the show before I get to my thoughts is that it's slow moving. And I see what people are saying, especially the first and second episode. I thought there were some parts that were slow moving, but it's all to a point, right? Because unless you're invested in these characters and their lives outside the game, it's not going to be the same reaction to what happens in the game and the same suspense. I mean, there's one episode, which I think is the fifth or sixth episode they're all paired up and playing this game. And that's all I'll tell you guys. I won't tell you what game or what happens. Thanks. <laughs> Suspense is unbelievable in that episode. You can't believe it. It's because you now know these characters and you're invested in what's going on. Sure. it's There's no wasted moments. However slow you think something is mm -hmm. going, it's not a wasted moment. It's all for a very good reason. Yeah. The other criticism I've heard, which is very strange. So it's from people who are fluent in Korean and in English. And they're watching it, listening to the Korean dialogue being spoken, and also reading the subtitles. And they're like, oh, you know, subtitles, that's not really what they're saying. It's its not a good job in the translation. And I'm like, okay, I mean, I guess that's a fair point. But what do you want to do about it? Like, okay, like, they're not accurate, you know. Yeah, I, I think I'm still getting the overall point of what's going on. Yeah, for non-Korean speakers, which is, you know, most of us in the world, it's like, okay, that's good. How does that affect, you know what I mean? There's nothing we, unless the idea is that had this been translated more accurately, it would have been a more poignant scene. Yeah, yes. Or it would have been a more compelling story. Yeah, and they have some examples. I'll link to an article where they talk about that. Yeah. Fair enough, but it's not like people are saying this show is trash, and then no. and then the people are like, no, but if they translate it better, it would have been not trash. It's not really what's going on. I felt that with Call My Agent. I don't know if you've you haven't. No, watched you mentioned Call it My before Agent. on the show. Yeah, I have. So Le Disposant out of France. I think it was four seasons. We watched every single episode. Loved it. And because I speak French, and I was we had the subtitles on for my benefit as well. For those things I would miss, but you know, especially for my wife. I go through that. I'm like, ah, that's not exactly what they said. I don't know why they didn't go with this. But in the end, love the show. So I'd be interested to hear about any translated, subtitled shows that ruined the experience. Right. That didn't work. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, some people have asked the director, when is Squid Game 2 coming out? And you could just tell he's <laughs> so exhausted by this whole ordeal and i'm sure he's happy i mean these actors these korean actors i read an interview with the person who plays jihun the other day they can't believe it like they're like i did this role in korea i didn't think it was and everybody in the world is talking about it and so yeah. huang dong hyuk is going to have this huge career in front of him and he can choose probably to do whatever he wants uh, yeah. because of the success of this it's kind of like daniel craig the most recent james bond his last turn at james bond just came out no time to die and i remember every time he plays james bond someone yeah. asked him are you coming back for the sequel and he's so exhausted he just completed the movie they finished post-production now he's doing all the press for it he's like i can't even think about this it's exhausting doing these movies and then he always came back eventually now this is for sure the last one sure. like, i find that so interesting like just the exhaustion as you were saying from being so committed Committed for Daniel Craig to the role of James Bond and, of course, for the writer and director of uh, Squid Game. 
I interview a lot of people for variety shows that I'm on, and it's such a selfish, self-indulgent question when you say, so what's next for you? It's like, can you not let me live in the moment? Like, sometimes it's appropriate. Sometimes somebody wrote something or starred in something. You know, I've interviewed authors who are on to their second or third book from that book. That book just happens to be catching fire now. Right. And so they say in the interview, it's very interesting that I'm talking about this book now because I haven't thought about those Mm -hmm. characters and that story for five years. I've written this and this. I think that then you can totally talk about what they're doing now. But often what's next for you is such a ridiculous question because I go through that myself where I had like dreams to be, you know, perform in soft seat theaters. These are my, my, this is like a dream. You just achieve your dream. Like, so what's next for you? I I don't know. I'm just achieving my dream. How about you let me have some fun with this? Further to what you're saying about the actor's experiences with this fame, Anupam Tripathi, who you mentioned, who plays that Ali Abdul character, Whose his Instagram... Whose name I pronounce very poorly. Probably. I kind of tune out when you pronounce any brown anything. <laughs> produce so, names. <laughs> yeah. Produce. His Instagram went from 10,000 to over 2.5 million in days. <laughs> just a matter of days. 2.5 million. So anyway, this is what some of these actors are going through, and it's quite phenomenal. So I'm going to try and speak. I, I don't think I really need to do any spoilers to give you my thoughts on on the show now that i finish it but overall i'm going to say it's good i think <laughs> spoiler alert it's good yeah you've heard the synopsis if you think that that would appeal to you it's extremely violent it's a lot of suspense and tension but it's this concept right if you think that concept sounds interesting and it's worth watching or checking out then i definitely think you should it's extremely well made and well done although asif i have to say i'm sorry to interrupt there i have to say that the synopsis i don't know if it covers it because this is such a human story Mm -hmm. it's almost like the games are incidental even though it's called a squid game i don't like game shows i don't care about game shows i've Mm -hmm. never watched a full asian game show even when japanese game shows were being fed to us i don't really care i've watched some you know gladiator or whatever it's called not get gladiator but you know this american american ninja warrior yeah that type of thing i've watched a little bit of that but i really don't care about those games so if it was really about the game i don't think i'd continue watching but i feel like it's the storytelling and these characters that really i agree but there are some people who are just going to be turned off by the violence and people competing to win that's for sure and they're going to be out and that's fine but if you're intrigued by what we're saying how about that and in Mm. terms of this character study because like i said if it was american i'm an american production they would have just jettisoned all the character development i think and they would have just kind of gone in for like the crazy game shows and people Mm -hmm. dying and stuff like that and i think they do a good job but that the there is a couple of subplots things that are left hanging not on purpose and if you there's some interesting articles where they say like these are our burning questions afterwards and you're like yeah whatever happened to that so there are a couple of things that kind of are left hanging and the biggest criticism i have is towards the later episodes there are some english speaking people who show up and their dialogue is so bad so badly written so badly performed it takes you out of the show so much oh, no. it, it, it's it's really oh, unbelievable no. okay. uh, how bad it is it's just such a juxtaposition to how good the rest of the show is sure. and uh, i think that's just the limitation of you know they had to get some english actors who weren't the best the director and <laughs> writer, writer, director is writing folks? a different I don't know. I don't. You you tell me when you get there what what you think what's going on. You should have done that. See, that's what I was saying. You should have you should have been one of those white dudes. So that is a bit of a, a downer. I didn't really like that. It really took me out of it. The ending it ends on kind of an ambiguous thing. I'll just leave mm-hmm. it at that. Is it possible there could be a sequel? It's possible. I, I like the way it ended. Somebody I follow on Twitter was like, "Ah, oh, the last episode is so boring." It was like a snooze. I'm like, that's because it follows what's been kind of a more common thing in kind of prestige dramas where the climax actually occurs in the second to last episode, in the penultimate episode. And it carries on in the first 10 or 15 minutes of the last episode. And then the rest is all denouement after that. And that's, Mm. you know, I don't don't criticize that because that is kind of the way storytelling kind of has been going on TV for the past 
five to 10 years. Prestige dramas do this all the time. And it's good because it has you live in the consequences of what just happened, right? Okay. Because then you'd be wondering what happened to this? What happened to this? I mean, it's not like Lord of the Rings, Return of the King, where there's like another hour of like, you know, conclusions and more scenes happening. This all makes sense in terms of what's going on. I think it's well done. I didn't think it was a snooze, but some people think that. Have you ever heard of anybody losing their teeth from stress? No, and I don't know what that's all about. Not disparaging any dental care in Korea, but I wonder if you had a pre-existing tooth problem beforehand. Right. I was uh, wondering if he was just grinding his teeth with be. like rage and stress. Maybe that was why, and he cracked them. So he yeah. lost teeth because he, you know. Yeah, yeah, like a night time from, yeah, having yeah, yeah. That, that teeth grinding or something like that. Yeah. Can't, can't relax. Yeah, it's certainly possible. Okay, good. I'd like to end on a medical note before I move on to something medical. What do you think of that? All right, Asif, we are going to ask if doctors should cry. Specifically, what we're asking is uh, we're asking you if there's a professionalism that is being discredited or a professionalism mm -hmm. that is is lost if a doctor right. wears their emotions on their sleeves. And of course, I should let our listeners know, I've known you since you were an infant and you've done a lot of crying. So <laughs> pre-doctor, you were quite the crier. So yeah, so I, let's... I, <laughs> Like I said, let's be specific. We're talking about crying in front of patients. What, yes. what you do in your own time or when Ali steals, like, you know, the, the yeah, last bowl of, uh, you know, <laughs> Fruity Pebbles when he's at my house. Then I was, I was a, a guest. Kid. It was justified. So we're talking about crying in front of patients. So I'm curious. We had Joe Everyman on the podcast. Uh, is the he making day. a return today? <laughs> what does Joe Everyman think about, about that? Uh, I think it's weak. And loserish if you cry because you're a doctor. I think Joe Everyman is a bit of a loser. So <laughs> it's a good, interesting question and something that's been debated a lot, especially on social media. Med Twitter, hashtag Med Twitter. Uh -huh. If you want to go there and see some interesting takes about lots of topics in medicine, or you want to hear people like just standing on their soapbox and not listen to other people's opinions, which is basically the definition Twitter. of Twitter. Yeah. I don't have to say Med Twitter. So should doctors cry? There is some evidence that we're just looking at surveys and seeing what people think. So here's some data. 50% of people disagreed with the statement. Okay. It's a bit of a double negative. 50% of people yeah. disagree with the statement that physicians crying in the presence of a patient is appropriate. So the statement is it is appropriate and 50% of people said, no, it is not. Yeah. I mean, because it's 50%, it's easy to say 50% agreed. So there's a bit of yes, equipoise. It is. Yes, it is. That's good. On that, That's right? Yeah. So 50% perceive crying physicians as still fit for a job. Okay. That's mm. probably good, but it's still 50% only. And slightly more than 40% endorse the statement that a crying physician is a good physician because they're expressing empathy for well, the patient. I wonder if it's like, have people ever thought like, yeah, it was it was great being in that doctor's care, but you know what I really missed? An opportunity for that doctor to weep. Had they wept, I would have really given them a top rating. Like is that is it that? Is anybody saying that? Is anybody like I don't think so. I've never heard of that before and I I I mean, I'd be curious to see our lots of our listeners have been patients or have had relatives that are patients. Sure. I don't know. I can't imagine that being the case. Right, right, right. So it's not something people need, but it is something people will sometimes see. And when they see it, you are telling me what their reaction is. Yeah. Those other surveys were of patients. But when we talk about physicians, like how do physicians feel? Mm. Basically, some physicians think it may be acceptable in certain circumstances if it's benefiting the patient, right? may help them to process their sadness, build a relationship with them. And that's kind of the consensus amongst physicians. But some are worried and they feel strongly about this. Again, there's a certain population of physicians that feel you should never cry in front of a patient mm. because maybe that's actually showing that you're burnt out, right? Maybe, so, and when you're doing that, now you're putting your own issues to the patient and they shouldn't have to deal with that, right? I see what they're saying. When you're a physician dealing with a patient, your primary role should be the care of the patient and their family in front of you. That is the priority, in my opinion. I deal with pediatrics. So I'm talking about when I say crying in front of patients, I actually mean crying in front of the parents. If you're giving them some very bad news, 
I mean, I can't imagine crying in front of a child. Like if they're crying and I'm crying with them, maybe with a teen, you know, an older teen, if if they're really processing that emotion. But for a young child, you know, I'm not sure that that's that would be that reassuring. Their physician, cry, you know, giving them bad news and crying in front of them, especially if they're not crying, right? A lot of yeah. this should be: Are you crying with your patient, right? If you're breaking down in tears and they're stoic, just sitting there, I'm not sure. Listen, man, I I think there's another element here, which is what kind of crying. Do you know what I mean? Like, I know that that's a weird thing to say, but a little bit of welling up of tears in the eyes, Mm -hmm. one tear, it's it's such a human moment, right? Especially you mentioned kids for doctors working with kids and doctors who were like, we have a fighting chance and this could work. And then if that child dies to have a human moment with the parents and have, you know, shed one tear. But if you're openly weeping and the the patient is like, should I give this doctor a hug? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, you know, that mm-hmm. that's obviously in a, a very bad place. I'm sure there's some doctors who are like, if we say that crying is good, what precedent does that set? Now, all of a sudden, we're also trained actors like our doctors, like, yeah. you know, in the in yeah. their room going, like, all right, all right, let's bring on the waterworks. Yeah. And then they yeah. walk out to, like, try to be that yeah. doctor. I mean, that's a dangerous place to go. So that's why it's so human if it does happen. Yeah, exactly. And I think it probably is circumstantial, depends on the circumstances you're in. And that's why having some of this data is good. It's good to know that it's a 50-50 chance that your patient might think it's good and might think it's not, right? So it mm. maybe depends on your specific interaction, how well you know the family. There's another survey which just looked at whether physicians had cried or not, not necessarily in front of patients, but just cried. And 88.7% of participants said they cried at least once in the past year. And then almost 50% cried in in the workplace at least once. In the last year specifically? And that's that's a recent study? So we're talking about pandemic? No, it was pre-pandemic, pre-pandemic. It's yeah. pre-pandemic, okay, because when you talk about burnout and you talk about... Yeah, I mean, that's, know, a whole, crying, that's a whole that's other... a whole other issue. And we, again, I always say this, but we do need to talk about physician burnout one day because it's mm-hmm. a very real thing. And that's the worry is this is a symptom of it. And maybe there's different specialties where this is occurring more because in this one survey we just talked about, it's happened more in gynecology and pediatrics. And you can imagine when you're when dealing with children, gynecology, I think they meant obstetrics and gynecology because obviously, you know, an infant dying or a mother really dying, a child, I mean, that's sure. that's very heavy, heavy stuff. That's surveys. I want to kind of point you guys to an article that's in The Guardian where they just interviewed various healthcare workers and kind of get their thoughts on it. Some different aspects. Some people saw, thought it was unprofessional. Again, that's been said a lot. And that's when I talk about med Twitter. They're like, I can't believe people are saying it's unprofessional to cry in front of patients. It's not. You know, some people, so, so there's, there's some people think it's unprofessional. And then there's the backlash towards that. Hmm. And then other people say it's, it depends on the certain situations, but it's about the patient and their family. And it's their grief that matters most, which I definitely agree with. There's one interesting quote. I'll just read this to you. I was crying and I saw this as a weakness. And a doctor, this was not a doctor. This was another healthcare worker. This person said to the doctor who was with them, I can't believe I still cry every time. I was embarrassed by my tears. The doctor turned and said, the day you don't cry is the day you should stop working in medicine. And this person was a nurse. And the person said, now the tears come because I'm not ashamed because once I have Mm. no more feelings... My passion will be gone, and I should probably stop being a nurse. Of course. Well, we, uh, you know, I've always said that about stand up comedy. People go, Do you still get nervous? And often I, I do get at least, you know, I can handle it better. It's not like running to the bathroom and like having uncontrollable diarrhea, but it is like a little <laughs> bit of butterflies in your stomach. And people are like, Wow, you've been doing comedy 15 years, still get nervous. For me, the perspective is exactly what that doctor says. Once you stop getting nervous, it feels mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. oh, do you not care about this anymore? Like mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm, it's mm-hmm. that said, it's also possible that that nurse could have met a doctor who was like, once you stop crying, that's the day you become a real nurse, right? It's just an opinion yeah. at the end of the day. It's not. I feel of two minds about it. On one hand, like I, I cannot, I cannot speaking for myself, afford to break down in tears after every single patient that I see. And obviously, I'm giving good news sometimes, too. I don't just give bad news. You're not a dentist. <laughs> That's uh-huh. right. Telling telling the writer-director of Squid Game, uh, six teeth now. I'm not always giving bad news. So obviously, I'm not going to cry. But even with the upsetting things, I can't do that. 
you have to maintain my opinion. Don't come at me. This is what I think about myself. So <laughs> I'm allowed to think whatever I I, I feel Ooh, about this. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Somebody will judge me for thinking it. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess yeah, not. But social close. media tells me what to think, I guess. So no, but I don't think I could handle it if I broke down in tears every single time and thought to myself, oh my God, what if this was my child? I cannot mm. do that in every single situation. One more quote from this article is another nurse saying, I've only cried with patients and families when they've been crying too, which is, I mean, this makes sense to, to me. Mm. It feels right when my feelings and responses are mirroring theirs because we're sharing the same emotions. And they say there's solidarity in that. The quote is, for me as a nurse, it would feel wrong to be more upset as than the family. It's mm. their moment, not mine. It wouldn't be right if they felt the need to comfort me if I was visibly distressed and they weren't. At those times, I should go to my colleagues for support. And this right. is all very reasonable. Yeah, I think. yeah, I think that's a great sum up right there. Now, you hinted at something just now, and if you don't want to, I won't force this out of you. I don't know if this is like not something you're you're supposed to be talking about, but you said it's weird if I cry every time. Does that suggest that you have had moments where you break down in front of patients, and are you able to talk about that? I would say it's very similar to that nurse that we talked about, and obviously, I'm not going to be very specific at all with the patients, no, of what, who I'm talking about, because yeah. That's Confidentiality and, and it's nobody's business, really. So, but yeah, I, I have. And sometimes it's, as you said, Ali, it's like just, you know, a, a tear. Not, I, I said a single tear. It's not like I controlled one single tear coming out of my eyeball. Mm. I'm not an actor who to, to can do that. But, you know, it's it's like your eyes well up and the tear comes out. It's, it's usually families that I've gotten to know, whether over mm. years, but usually it's over a short period of time. Usually it's a short, intense period of time that I've gotten to know them over weeks or sometimes months. Sometimes that happens. And other times it's, I was thinking of one particular example where the patient was very sick for a very uh, long time, like you know a couple months in the ICU. And this one I felt a bit bad about for myself because they had kind of figured out this was the end. I hadn't seen them for a couple of weeks for various reasons. I wasn't on call. They were in a different hospital and things like that. So then when I saw them, they were more stoic than me because they mm. had kind of come to terms with everything. But right. I had, And then I started to cry. So that's an example where I felt like, you know, I should probably, and I gave them a hug, which I, you know, I don't often do. There's many reasons. Should doctors hug patients should be another one. But in general, you probably <laughs> shouldn't be doing that. There's yeah. many reasons for that. That's probably going too far a lot of times. But sometimes mm. it is, especially if you have a relationship. And again, you know, it's hard to say, but you just kind of know when it's appropriate. And so so they gave me a hug and I, I did feel a bit bad that time because I thought, you know what, I feel they're comforting me a bit more than I'm comforting them. And I, I don't know. Now looking back, I think it was, I don't think they were upset at all. And I think they knew how much I cared about them. And this was a young person, not yeah, the parents? Yeah, a child. A who, child, yeah. Who I was hugging or who it was? Who was comforting you in this situation, who you felt was comforting you? This yeah, was, it was somebody the under 10? It was the parents. It because was the, the parents, child was, not the, the child. child was about to die. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, I was just trying to get the visual. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they were upset about it. I think they have many other things to worry about other than that. Sure. But again, I don't want to be like a burden to them and them having to comfort me. So I think, you know, when I have to summarize everything with this, like, in my opinion, I think... Is it appropriate sometimes to cry in front of patients? I do think it is. Do I think you should be doing that in front of every patient that makes you sad or whose situation feels sad? In my opinion, probably not. Mm. I'm not going to go so far as to say it's unprofessional, but I do agree with some of the people who worry that that may be indicating burnout. And so I think that needs to really be considered. You need to have some self-reflection about that. But I think sometimes, again, if you're, as was mentioned in those quotes, if you're kind of mirroring the family and you're crying with them and there's nothing wrong with with showing that empathy, again, I would caution that you want to do it with families that you know relatively well, you should not be getting more upset than they are. Mm -hmm. should not be out of proportion. There is one thing I'd like to share with the listeners right now, Asif, that people would not know about you unless they were a friend of yours. You have some leaky tear ducts. One could say so. Every time you laugh, your eyes water. Yes. So uh, you know maybe that's a little trick. Are you I, crying, Doctor Dosha? No, no, no. I, no. I just watched an old Simpsons episode. And, uh, so yeah. this is we're ending this on a bit of a lighthearted note. So I do have leaky tear ducts, and the problem is, it's not just when I'm laughing and watching The Simpsons or Seinfeld or things like that. It also happens when 
it's allergy season right. and if I'm out in the cold. So, for example, I was watching my daughter's soccer game the other day and they were losing and I'm wiping tears from my eyes. And the other parents are like, oh, my God, like, relax, buddy. Yeah. It's, it, and so this is so this is so funny you mentioned this because sometimes I'm giving people good news. But the tears are coming out just because it's allergy season. That's hilarious. And then they're probably like, "What do you? I, I well, thought this know, was good news. Why are you thing for the worst?" I mean, it's crazy. And, and <laughs> even when I when I've gone to my own doctor's appointments and they're telling me something, I'm wiping away tears. They're probably like, "Okay, <laughs> relax. It's fine. You have obstructive sleep apnea. You need a CPAP machine. It's, it's okay." And oh, I cry about that for sure. If I find that out, I'm crying a hundred percent. If anybody ever finds himself in a situation where they were crying and they felt like they shouldn't be crying, yeah, you got an excuse now. Uh, leaky tear duct. Just like Dr. Asif Doja, my hero. Okay, so that's it for today. Let us know what you guys thought about this episode. Very curious because we're asking for some opinions this time. What do you think about Squid Game? We don't have the water cooler conversation anymore because of remote work and, and, the, and the pandemic. So let us know on Twitter, Dr. V Comedian, on Instagram, email us, drvcomedian, gmail.com. Let us know. And what do you think? Should doctors cry in front of patients? I think it's an interesting discussion. I'd be curious to see other people's opinions. Whether you're in healthcare or not, I think I'd be very curious to hear what people have to say. I'm most curious to hear from anybody who ever thought that I was hoping for a more human yeah. moment from my doctor. If anybody had a doctor that didn't cry and the patient thought, I wish I had seen something a little more human and emotional from mm -hmm. them. Does that exist? Is that something? I mean, you know, they make all kinds of people these days. There's got to be people who think that as well. That, that I think that would be a very interesting opinion to hear. That is it. Give us a like, subscribe, recommend to one friend. We're having a good time. We're picking up steam in this podcast. We're getting some love from a variety of venues and platforms, and we're, we're very happy to keep this show going. And uh, just remember to turn on the automatic downloads. You'll see that on iTunes. If you listen on not iTunes, Apple Podcasts, I should say, in the top right-hand corner, there's going to be an automatic downloads. Turn that on. That helps us out a lot. And remember... That although I'm a doctor, I'm not your doctor. Medical issues we talk about are for your interest and information only, and they're not medical advice. Please consult medical professionals for actual medical advice. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye.